Hello, and welcome to Inside ETFs, the podcast where we bring the latest and greatest ETF industry perspectives directly to you through in-depth discussions with key thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm your host, Douglas Jonas, the head of exchange-traded products at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Now, today I'm joined by Sal Gilberti. Sal's the chief executive officer, chief investment officer, and founder of Tucrium. Now, if you're not familiar with Tucrium, the firm is an ETF provider focused solely on U.S. agricultural products, covering everything from corn, soybeans, sugar, wheat, in addition to a broad commodity ETF made up of all of the above. Sal began his career in commodities with Cargill in 1982. He then traded energy and agricultural commodities at DLJ, Merrill Lynch, and Bear Stearns. And immediately prior to founding Tucrium, Sal headed the Renewable Fuels and Commodities Derivatives Liquidity Desk for New Edge USA, a subsidiary of SockGen. While there, Sal developed the standard contract used today in the ethanol markets, and he has designed a variety of commodity-based ETFs, is considered one of the world's experts regarding investments in agricultural and energy. Sal, thank you so much for being here today. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, Douglas. So let's get right into this. You know, how did you begin this career in the commodities markets? What is it that attracted you to that part of the financial industry? That's a great question. I always love to buy and sell things. And literally in school and in college, I saw a an ad uh, on the jobs board for a company called Cargill, whom I had never heard of. And I looked them up on microfiche. It was a long time ago in the early 80s see who they were. I read a bunch of articles, everything I could find on them, went to the interview. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife, gave me a a tie. You wore ties in those days with pigs on it. And I walked in the interview and said to the guy, these are pork bellies. I want to trade for you. And he hired me. He hired me on the spot. And I ended up trading um, oil and answering to the Geneva office in Cargill. It was a fun, fun time. So for, for our younger listeners, we'll let you Google microfiche later. And, uh, and for, for those that remember the microfiche days, let us all just be happy they're behind us. Uh, now, as many of our listeners do know, the, the New York Stock Exchange parent company, Intercontinental Exchange, has been a leader in re- revolutionizing and creating a more efficient and transparent market for energy and for commodity products for the, for the past 20 plus years. You've been in that space during all that time, Sal. Tell us how you've seen, whether it be what ICE has done, whether other markets have done for commodities, what have those changes felt like for the last 30 years? And, and how are they impacting ultimately, you know, investor access, right? We're, this is a podcast for advisors, for investors. You know, how should they think about the landscape of commodities as that change has occurred when it comes to their ability to access the, the commodity markets, to trade them, how pricing looks, how costs happen, et cetera? Okay, I I think people forget that um, gold wasn't tradable until the the 70s and oil wasn't tradable by by mere mortals until until the mid 80s, nor was natural gas until till almost 1990. So as markets deregulated and opened up in commodity markets specifically, people got access to them. But it was first institutions like Cargill. We got to trade oil first. I remember when the crude oil contract was launched. I remember when the natural gas contract was launched. I was on that committee for, at the New York Stock Exchange to launch natural gas. The access to commodities came through deregulation. And then the exchanges, of course, jumped on it and, and listed, listed all kinds of contracts. And then ETFs came about. Now we're pushing 15 years where you could trade commodities through through ETFs. And so you you had this broad progression of access to the commodity, first future, then you know, retail futures, and then then through through the ETF mechanism, which is a brilliant mechanism, which allows people to to get direct access to commodities. And that's only about 15 years ago. So we have this this broad ability to access that advisors literally did not have. 15 years, 15 years or more ago, and no investor had who wasn't trading futures 30 years ago. And of course, the electronic trading, ICE, the, you know, you used to be in the pit, like, like trading places, you know, the, the movie trading places, which now the audiences are so young, they don't even know what that movie is. It's astounding. And so, you know, that was seen so long ago, but it's only in literally in the last, as you said, 20 to 30 years, where we've seen these tremendous changes, electronic trading, high speed trading, all of which has allowed the liquidity to grow, the market access to grow, the transparency to grow. 
which is is good for everyone and and good for markets and and in the end good for consumers of commodities which is everyone on planet earth and 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 any naysayers that think we only talk about etfs on this podcast we've now given you a, a movie to watch if you haven't seen trading places we're giving you things to google and and you're so right i mean access to commodities i think about it through almost the majority of my career sal i might have a viewpoint and and in fact we're going to get into it in in a moment because i want to talk about what's going on in russia but I see these headlines going across uh, the screen about Russia and the the volume of wheat that's being produced between Russia and Ukraine. In in most of modern finance history, you and I might have an, a, a a belief about, or we might want to express an opinion in our portfolio about where price of wheat might go or price of corn white might go. It really took ETFs to be able to bring that to you and me to actually reflect that, because unless you were an institution individual traders really had no access, right? I mean, you and I as a, as an individual, it's very difficult for us to go out and trade, uh, you know, sugar futures, I assume. Is that correct? Well, yeah. I mean, futures trading is a, is a really interesting thing. It's, it's highly dangerous. It's highly leveraged. It takes a, a certain um, skill set. And in fact, today, I, I bet you 98 or 99% of all institutions managing money, all people who manage money, be it their own or on behalf of someone else, still are restricted or not allowed completely to open a futures account. Futures require a high degree of specialized expertise. And here, here at Tucrium, we have that and other shops have it as well, where you package it inside of an ETF and suddenly a person can participate in the direct movement of a commodity up or down through an ETF that they trade just like a stock and the leverage is, is you know significantly less. I mean, a stock account traditionally due to federal reserve guidelines you have 50% leverage a futures account can have you know 20 to 1 versus a 2 to 1 and it takes a professional to manage that problem yeah for sure and and here we are you launched two cream in 2014 you've had great success already we're we're around 400 million in assets across your ETFs what is it that you know he, he, that brought you i guess out of focused heavily on on trading futures yourself and saying, hey, you know what? I need to be in ETFs and I need to to really combine my expertise in one area, but actually need to bring it to the to the world of ETFs. Well, I I was trading, uh, you know, I was running a liquidity desk and and tr- it's it started with ethanol and that that of course morphed into gasoline, it morphed into grains, ended up trading over thirty different commodities on this desk. And one of the things the desk did was provide liquidity for energy ETFs large energy ETFs who had hit their position limits or their accountability limits on the exchanges and needed to go over the counter, which in those days was still separate. You didn't have to count those as, as your position limits, which is the post Dodd Frank world. And so I, I looked at it and said, number one, I think I can, can design a better ETF than what was out there. And number two, there were no grain ETFs, which astounded me. I came from Cargill. You know, they're, they, they were built around grain elevators. They trade all commodities now. But it just it was it was a mystery to me that the two most important asset classes in people's lives, food and energy, food was not represented in the ETF world. And the last thing any human being will do is allow themselves or their animals to be cold or hungry. And the hungry part wasn't covered by ETFs. And so I stepped out. I, I actually came down to the New York Stock Exchange, pitched my idea and said, you know, if I started a corn ETF, I wish you had... Um, this is going way back. Okay. I wish you had four, four, four tickers versus three. You used to have a three symbol ticker versus four and you would just somehow merge the ticker system. I don't know the intricacies of it. You might know um, with the NASDAQ, which had a four, four, um, four character ticker. And I said, is corn available? And I remember the guy walked down the hall and came back and said, yeah, corn's available. And I just started rattling off all what I thought were great tickers and, and got them all. And, and I went back and and that was that was a part of forming the company and, and launching the funds. Cer- certainly, your list of tickers, and we'll get to all of them, are easy to remember because uh, you can't go. Obviously, corn is corn, uh, so you've got you've got the right lineup for sure. And again, uh, again, listeners, taking us through a bit of history as we go through the history of ETFs and the NMS system for for ticker symbols. Uh, I want to talk, Sal, about investing in commodities during what I'll put quotes around normal times, and we'll get there, but this is not a normal time. Uh, at the time we're recording this, Russia has invaded the Ukraine. Uh, I don't want to necessarily get into the politics here, but you know we should note, as mentioned prior, Russia and Ukraine together produce somewhere around 30% of the world's wheat supply. 
So if you're an investor and you're saying, hey, I have an expression that I'd like to put into my portfolio, you obviously have a wheat ETF. How should investors be sort of thinking about the broad wheat situation? As they would any other commodity. Commodities, the reason I'm in, in the commodities business is I'm not that smart. I, I, I boil things down. Things are really complicated in the world. And I boil things down to, is there enough or is there not enough? And that's how commodities work. If there's not enough, they, the price generally moves higher. And if there's enough or more than enough, the price generally is going sideways or lower. That's as complex as my mind can function. And that's that's why I got into the commodities business, honestly. So for us, any investor needs to look, commodities are really volatile, okay? It, just because you own an ETF that represents a commodity, be it oil or grains or, or anything else, you are going to experience the commodity that is also the, the volatility that is also in that commodity market in those futures markets. So you need to be aware of that. Commodities are a part of a portfolio. They can diversify a portfolio. They also are a good, good trading tool for those inclined to trade in and out. Those are two different things. Trading is different than investing. I'll say right here very clearly, I am not making a buyer seller recommendation ever. We're just talking about the market mechanics and how things work. That's left up to the individual investor. We will not be making buyer seller recommendations here. And that that being said, an investor should speak with their advisor and see where commodities, any commodity, fits into their portfolio. And it's mostly for diversification purposes. If we set aside trading, it's mostly for diversification purposes. And, and of course, I, I'd mentioned the symbol for corn. Wheat is W-E-A-T. So again, easy to remember. Um, okay, so so then let's talk a little bit about the the broad market. So here we are. Uh, you know, we've got Powell speaking today, talking about potential moves in interest rates again. Clearly, we're in an inflationary environment. Does the thesis for commodities? change one way or another based on if you're in an inflationary market or a non-inflationary market? I think it does. I think I think most um, people believe when you're in an inflationary market, you want to own things and commodities are are the, the base of all things. And so, you know, there, there are a lot of studies, you can get them from a lot of different places that show that being invested in commodities during inflationary times can be uh, of some help to a, to a well diversified portfolio, and so that's a very big, and that's that's where people should be looking. I mean, the Russian situation, which yes, you, you know, yes, earlier, Fed Chairman Powell spoke today to Congress and mentioned specifically palladium, I believe, corn, and wheat. And there are supply concerns for all of those because Russia and the Ukraine combined are so such big players, almost dominant in those in those two areas. And so that again goes back to supply demand fundamentals. Investors need to make their own decisions and be really careful in the in the volatile environment we're in. But um, you know, there there's things happening there. And when things are in the news and you have access to them through the ETF mechanism, they're they're available for people with their advisors to to make the proper investment decisions. So I've heard you speak uh, a lot about corn. I'll put you on the spot. It doesn't have to be corn. You could pick any of, of the commodities that you have. If, if, if you want to talk, sh- talk sugar, we can talk sugar. But I find it so interesting, your, your take, as you mentioned, around the idea that people always think about food and they always think about energy. Could you give us a little bit of your take, I guess, around uh, one, of the, you know, one of the markets that you're in and, and how an investor should think about you know, why, why would it make sense for me to, to own corn or to, to own uh, sugar, which is uh, C-A-N-E, cane, uh, easy to remember. All right, well, let's talk about grains. And, and if you just take a broad index like, like the S&P Grains Index, okay? There's a lot of, lot of companies out there that publish indices. And s and is very reputable, and they, they have indexes on just about everything. And if you take the, the – and none of our funds are based on the S&P indexes, just, just to be clear. But as an example, if you take the S&P Grains Index and you, you look at its performance against the S&P 500 in the last 11 – drawdowns of 10% or more bear markets. And this is from high to low. So we're actually in the 12th, but we're not including that in data because we don't know if we've hit the low yet and going out of the bear market. So in in the last 11 times that the S&P 500 has had a drawdown of 10% or more and entered technically a bear market, from the high to the low drawdown, 10 of those 11 times, the S&P grains index outperformed the S&P 500 index. And I think once or twice, I'd have to go back and check the data, it was actually positive. 
So the grains were actually positive where the S&P was negative. Most of the times, they so everything correlates, all right? Grains just seem to correlate less than many of the other commodities. There's not, there's not a, a divergence here. There's simply a lower correlation. And why is that? Well, as we said earlier, you, you're not going to stop eating. It doesn't matter to any, you know, folks in New York, to put it bluntly, are not going to skip their morning bagel just because there's a new iPhone out or the S&P 500 dropped 10%. They're still going to eat their morning bagel, which is made of wheat, which has a lot of other commodities with it, depending on what you put on it. And so, you know, that is why, as one of the guys in my shop says, uh, our, our head analyst, Jake Hanley, he says, grains zig when stocks zag. And that that's what you want for a diversified portfolio. So people people who look at that, and again, that study that, that we did, and you can find that, that on our website, um, the last 11 times the S&P 500 is worth repeating, declined 10% or more, the S&P grains index either declined yes, less or went up. So it really helped a diversified portfolio by holding grains. And, and of course, that website, if you're not familiar with Tucrium, it's T-E-U-C-R-I-U-M. It's Tucrium.com. And you can find a lot of the information Sal's talking about on their website. I, I, I want to talk again a little bit more deeper about commodities because there is a difference and if if you're you know a novice and you're coming into this there's there's a very big difference between the spot market versus the futures market could you talk a little bit to our listeners about what what the differences are what is that and and, and ultimately what does it mean to them as an investor right if they're investing thinking potentially they own one versus the other Absolutely. That's a great question. It's going to, we'll take a couple of minutes on that because that's important, Douglas. Um, spot price is the, is the price of that commodity right now. If you had to buy the actual commodity right now, that's the spot price. So let's just take oil and I'll make some numbers up. Okay. If you, if you want to buy a barrel of oil right now, let's just say it costs a hundred dollars for ease of example. It actually is right around a hundred dollars. But, yeah, I think it's 110 today. I think yeah, it hit. Yeah, high. so let's just say 100. So that's that's spot oil. But there, so commodities, a normal commodity market has what they call the cost of carry built into it, and some people call that a big fancy word, contango. I very simple. I remember it because they both begin with a C. The cost of carry begins with a C. Carry and contango both begin with a C. What it means is if you buy something and hold it, you have to store it, and there's a cost associated with that. So if you buy a barrel of oil and store it, it, it's gonna cost you something, and we'll make up numbers, okay? Let's say it costs you a dollar a month to store that oil. So if you buy a barrel of oil today for $100 and take delivery of it and put it in storage, next month, that oil, all else being equal, and all else is never equal, but all else being equal, that oil should be worth $101 because you paid a hundred dollars for it and you put a dollar into storing it. So in a perfect world, all else being equal and no insurance costs, no, no, no interest costs, let's just pretend it just costs you a dollar to park this oil somewhere. The, every month that goes by, the, the oil should be worth $1 more. So that's, that's a normal market. It's called a carry market or a contango market. And, and, the only way for you to participate in that market is to actually buy physical oil, take delivery of it, rent some oil storage space for the oil, and hold it and then resell it in the future. Now, that's really hard, and normal people don't do that. An ETF can't do that either. It's too hard and too expensive. An ETF will hold futures, and futures are just that. They, they are for delivery in the future, and there are very strict limits on – how much oil, uh, how much of any future of any commodity you can own in spot month, meaning you're about to take delivery. And, you know, an oil tanker, if you own futures, isn't going to, an oil truck's not going to pull up to your front yard and say, where do I put your barrel of oil? They, what they do is they, there's, there are delivery points and storage points where you make and take delivery. Only the pros do that. If you're an ETF and you're, and you're, you're buying futures, you're going to buy futures, but you have to sell the spot month future because you're not going to take delivery. So you own the second month future. So while spot oil is worth $100, just say in our example, the, what you actually own is worth 101 or you're going to pay 101 for it because you have to buy that future. You have to buy that future contract and hold it. The ETF has to buy it. So what will happen is at the beginning of the year, the press will say, well, the spot oil is worth 100 bucks. Okay. At the end of a the year, they'll say spot oil is worth $100. Well, guess what? If that's if 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 this price of spot oil didn't change for a year, you would assume your investment would be flat. If you own that oil and paid a dollar a month to store it, you, your oil is only worth eighty-eight dollars to you. 
because you have you have twelve dollars storage in you. So that's where people lose money. And the the ETF because futures prices are perfectly priced all the time and factor in that storage, your ETF is only going to be worth eighty eight dollars. And that's where people get confused. So understand when you buy an ETF, especially a futures based ETF. And again, precious metals are different. They actually own they own that, and we can get into that in a minute if you want. But oil, you, it it just it's it's impossible to store in in large quantities for in it for an ETF. And so you would you don't own spot oil. You own the futures contract that your ETF owns. So understand. Look under the hood. Understand what your ETF owns and understand that your ETF price will move with the price of what it owns, not with the price of a spot commodity. And I, I hope that's a good explanation. I, I, I think so. And, and so for your ETFs, you've got corn, wheat, soybean, which is SOYB, cane, uh, which is sugar. And then, of course, tags, which, which holds a bit of each. Those all are owning the futures then, correct? They're not owning the underlying commodity? That's correct. And when we first launched our funds, we were the only people in those days, the, the oil funds that were out there, uh, oil and natural gas, there were no grains funds. They only owned that second month future, which was almost spot. So they remember, that's going to be a lot more volatile. That's going to that's going to react to the news. It's going to track. We decided, look, that's that's really not good. What you need to do is probably design something that's better for people. If, if you're trading, if your time horizon is four to six weeks or less, those those um, ETFs that hold front month futures or a single month futures, they're terrific. They're a great trading vehicle, but they're not a good investment vehicle. What you want are ETFs that hold out the curve. And there are many of them, not just two cream ETFs that do that. But if you're going to be a buy and hold investor, and by that, I mean more than four or six weeks, roughly, you, you want to own an ETF that owns things out the curve. We happen to design ours so that you own the, the second and third month so that you do spot that tra- track that spot month you know, a little better price. And then you own the, what we call an anchor month. So for instance, in, in corn, that's December. And why is that? That's because the December contract is the contract that's most widely used by farmers to hedge their product when it comes out of the fields in the, in the autumn, in the late autumn. And so you want to be where the pros are. And the further out the curve you get, normal humans aren't trading that. People who just think about those commodities are trading that. That's what they do. You want your money to be parked with those people. And so that's how we designed our funds. And others have designed funds since, you know, since we launched a long time ago. Ours were called second generation funds. And now, you know, they've lost count of the generations that are out there and people take these things into account. Got it. And, and and staying, you know, on the broad commodity market for a minute, right? A lot of conversation, certainly not only in this podcast, but certainly across, I think, advisors, there's a lot of conversation around this ESG focus, how we think about ESG. Part of ESG tends to also bring the idea of climate change. And we've had a lot of discussions with other experts that talk about the potential for climate change to impact certain areas of the market. And and certainly, I have to imagine that this comes up in your world of in agricultural markets. Are there are there ways that those that are that are investing, that are trading corn, soybeans, wheat, sugar, are there differences across them? How are they thinking about environmental change, environmental impact? Well, most people are looking, of course, at at, at ethanol, which is derived from corn and sugar, as uh, a way to to mitigate climate impact. We, you know, many. Of, of the studies that are credible, and there's a lot of nonsense out there, but the true studies that are credible, ethanol production is is better than oil production for the world. And in the end, burning ethanol in your in your internal combustion engine is a better prospect for the climate and for for carbon emissions than than burning pure hydrocarbons, you know, that, that, that come from oil. And so we, we're getting a lot of attention there. Obviously, the, the, the second largest use of corn in the world is to produce ethanol. The first largest is to feed animals. People forget that. But, you know, every time you consume an animal product of any kind, that was fed with grain. And that's that's the number one use of, of corn. Sugar, same way. Human consumption is is first and then and then to make ethanol. And so we're getting a lot of, of attention there. The other thing is renewable diesel. So I think most people know what bio diesel is and that's that's um, diesel fuel that has you know five or ten percent of of say soybean oil and mixed with it blended with it and that that makes it more environmentally friendly but there's something now which is actually chemically different it's called renewable diesel that those plants are being built around the country and in fact around the world and that that uses um, uh, oil seeds as a, as a feedstock and that produces um, 
things that can be burned in airplanes. They've run Air Force jets on them. There are there are airlines that say they're going to go to renewable diesel. So that's that's going to impact at some point all the oil seeds markets, not just soybeans, but but palm oil and sunflower seeds and rape seeds and everything. And and again, there's you know there's cooking oil and then there's 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 cooking oil that's going to be used for fuel. There's waste oil that's used for fuel, which is being happening happening now. And the way they process it, it's it's renewable diesel versus biodiesel. And that's a really important distinction that's up and coming. You'll see that happening over the next six to 18 months. It's happening now. New plants are coming online. And that's going to be a new demand source for oil seeds. Yeah, I was going to say that ultimately as an investor, then where does that net out? Does that mean as a result of more focused on renewables that there's more demand for the underlying you know, commodity? Or, or how should we think about that? Um, there should be more demand. But again, you know, the, the technologies evolve very quickly. And as as we, we wind down, you know, as you so alternative fuels, will ethanol that makes jet fuel, okay, ethanol is going to going to it's it's called the uh, aviation fuel. So so when you when you make an environmentally friendly aviation fuel that can come from ethanol. So as we get rid of internal combustion engines on the ground, you're not getting you can't run an electric engine in the plane. No one no one's figured that out yet. So the, the combustible fuels are going to be used in airplanes more than in cars. Now, I don't know how, how long that's going to take. Is that going to take 20 years, 30 years? We don't know. But the macro trend is going to be for, for the fuels that are used now in ground-based internal combustion engines, some of those are going to be converted for use in internal combustion engines in the air. And right now, the two that are, that are targeted are going to be ethanol and uh, renewable diesel. Interesting. And it's so interesting when you start to get down into the deep world of ethanol, because I know you've talked about it a lot. I've watched some of your pod, uh, some of your interviews uh, where you talk about ethanol. And I always in the back of my mind think of my dad, who's an avid boater and his his uh, anger towards ethanol for for boaters. But I wonder if if you'll see maybe you have a prediction for us on the marine world. Will marine uh, engines ultimately adapt? Uh, well, you know, the electric engines they use around here for fishing is about as close as I can get to that. What they're going to do, bunker fuel for, for ships, ocean-going ships is a very big deal. But again, that's not gasoline. So for the for the uh, sports enthusiast who's like your dad, who's, who's got a, you know, got a, a boat for pleasure and he's using a gasoline engine, that's a problem. Ethanol attracts water and you've got to, you've got to get your, your, your gasoline without ethanol. But I'm guessing those people are working on solutions to that now, but you know, that's a pretty small sector of the market. Not, not really going to be, not really going to move the needle there. I imagine. Uh, Sal, I know we're talking a lot about the different commodity space. Again, for those listening, you can, you can find a lot more at tucrim.com, but I want to shift gears slightly to what has become a, a favorite, at least uh, topic across most, I think, tables across America, which is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Tucrim, you know, uh, here we are talking commodities, but, but Tucrim, by, by far, you've been interested in the, in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space for a while. Tell us what you're working on and, and what you're thinking with respect to, to where that might lead for, for you and your business. Well, as you well know, we were the first to file in the latest round when when you knew you could file for a Bitcoin fund. And I can't say more than that because it's still a, an active filing. So we can't really go there, but we did file for, for a Bitcoin fund, futures-based Bitcoin fund. That's public knowledge. Bitcoin's here to stay. What what we do with that fund or, or other funds that come, I, I, you know, I just can't comment on it right now. But I'll say this. Bitcoin, I think, has taken an immense amount of money away from gold. And I know that, you know, since we're talking commodities here, people are wondering why the price of gold kind of leveled off and didn't go anywhere. And I, my brain reduces everything to supply and demand. And gold gets mined. You can look up the statistics. There's, there's you know, an amount of gold that's going to be mined every year and it's increasing every year. And there's Bitcoin gets mined electronically and there's an amount of bitcoin that's going to going to get mined but it's finite and decreasing every year and so or at least harder to mine harder to mine every year which means it will start to decrease if it hasn't already i don't know but the point is i think bitcoin is a store of value it's not a transactional platform obviously it's not fast enough and there there's ethereum and and solana and all these other things that are going to be going to you're light years ahead of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a store of value just like gold. But I think when you start looking at Bitcoin when it was at its price highs and almost worth a trillion dollars all by itself, that's so much money 
that had Bitcoin not existed would have been in gold, I think we would have seen gold at much higher highs. But there's supply and demand of both money and the asset that money's chasing. And we had plenty of supply of money and it went to Bitcoin. That's what it did. And so my my view is gold versus Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin wins that in the long run. I think in terms of in terms of value play, you can't, you know, other than turning the electricity off, you can't turn Bitcoin off. And I, I get it that the SEC has not approved the physical Bitcoin ETF. I think that people are um, not being realistic if they think the SEC will approve a physical Bitcoin ETF. And I've said it many times, the difference between Bitcoin ETF and a gold ETF is clear. Gold, you, you keep vast amounts of it in a big pile and there's a, you know, there's a no neck guy with a gun standing in front of it. And you can go with your auditor once a year when you're auditing your fund and its holdings and see that guy and touch that gold. And you know, it's there. And with, with Bitcoin, well, all of us know it's real, it's safe, it's there. It's, it's, you know, you, you have basically a pencil neck computer geek pointing at his screen saying, you have to believe in this code and the Bitcoin's there. That's never going to pass muster just from an audit standpoint. It's just not. And you got a lot of years to go before a, a physical Bitcoin ETF gets approved by the SEC. And that's the reason. That's the, there are a lot of other reasons, but that is the main reason. That's it. I, I, I have to say, I find it fascinating that um, you compare things based on the size of people's necks. But but <laughs> let, let me continue. I, I have a favorite question I'd love to ask uh, all of our participants. And by the way, uh, for our listeners, I apologize for any noise you're hearing ringing and beeps. Sal is literally calling us in from his trade desk. That's how uh, involved he is in the commodity market. So, so Sal, thank you for the time. I want to ask you my favorite question, which is you look at your lineup and when you launch an ETF, I know you know anyone who's been in that space has said, boy, this thing's going to really take off. Is there an ETF in your lineup that you think should have really taken off, should be you know really well-known, widespread, and just hasn't, hasn't gotten that lift yet that you were expecting? Soybeans. I, I, you know, corn is the is the largest commodity grown in the U.S. It's 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 just gigantic. But corn, corn and soybeans fight for acres, and often they're they're they they're planted equal amount of acres. Soybeans are worth more than corn when there's an equal. It, it's just it's astounding that that people ignore soybeans unless they're eating edamame at a, at a dinner. So soybeans again. Reminder ticker symbol S O Y B. Sal, thank you so much for joining us from Tucrium. That's a wrap on this edition of the Inside ETFs podcast. As a reminder, you can find this episode as well as many other episodes of the Inside ETFs podcast on the New York Stock Exchange's website, homeofetfs.com. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us as Sal shared his insights. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes featuring thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm Douglas Jonas, head of exchange traded funds at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. 